Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at our latest Dysgraphia Life webinar as part of our webinar series. Um, if you have not been to check out our website, it's at www.dysgraphia.life. Um, and we love to hear from our community. So please email us at info at dysgraphia.life to give us suggestions, let us know what you thought of the webinar. We'd love to hear from you. We are constantly trying to improve, provide more helpful information and products and services for the community. The latest thing that we've launched is our new professionals database. So if we have professionals in the audience, please check it out and consider joining. The number one question we have gotten from community members is, how do I find someone who tutors or can diagnose or um, does OT who's near me? And so we are letting you create listing pages so that our community can find your services. I'll be putting the link to that resource in the chat shortly, and um, we look forward to having many of you join it. We are currently building many more filter and search tools for that resource. But one of the things we do the most is provide education to our community, and that is why we are here tonight. We are thrilled to have Dr. George McCloskey joining us. He is the professor and director of school psychology research at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. We have his very extensive and impressive bio. You can see it on our website. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I will tell you that he um, specializes in executive function and he works with students who have writing difficulties. So today he's really gonna focus his talk on executive functions in writing and talking about how that applies to difficulties in writing that are gonna be relevant to those in our community. Um, he has written a number of books on this topic. I'll be putting a link to the slides from today's handout. So that has the handouts for today's talk in the chat box, but please notice that one of his latest books is actually a children's book on executive function. And we have put the link for that book on our page as well. So um, Dr. McCluskey, we are so thrilled to have you here. I will join back in at the end with questions for everybody watching. Please put your questions in the Q&A box um, and we will be going through them and asking the most popular questions to Dr. McCluskey at the end. And with that, I'm going to let him share his slides and take it away. Very good. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you tonight. Uh, we do want to talk about uh, executive functions and writing. So <clears throat> the material I'm going to offer you just a little bit on executive function as a background. Uh, and then um, we are going to really you know, focus mo mostly on the connection between executive functions and, uh, and writing. Uh, so uh, just to start here, you know, some this is the overview of, of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, just very quickly here, to talk a little bit about executive functions, the difference between a learning and producing disability, uh, how executive functions are involved in the writing. That's going to be our real focus here. And how do you know if there's a writing problem that related to executive function difficulties? And then some instructional techniques that we can use uh, when individuals are having these kind of difficulties. And executive functions, very often we, we think about this as the uh, conductor of the brain or the CEO of the brain. And, and this isn't quite uh, going to get the job done for us. And we know that there are many facets and many aspects to executive control. And uh, you could better, maybe a better metaphor for it be the management structure of a, of a multinational mine corporation or the brain supervisory system. And so we're, we're talking not just about a CEO of the brain, but the CEO and all the other managers in the, in the corporation. And there are many of them. And so we have a situation here where we've got a supervisory system within the frontal lobe. And that supervisory system is responsible for supervising the workers. The workers or any other parts of the brain uh, that, that we can think of, just about any part of the brain can come under executive control. Perceptions, feelings, thoughts, and actions are all able to be consciously directed by executive control. Uh, and we're going to talk about specifically you know, how, how you deal with that with writing. And of course, some of these basic executive functions that you've heard about, these are some of the ones that you may have heard about in, in, in various sources. Uh, but I would suggest to you that's even more than these. Uh, there are at least 33 of them. And these are seven different clusters within which these 
self-regulation supervisors are, are located. And all these are playing a role when we're talking about writing. So I'm not gonna be specific about this in terms of which executive function is, is in control here at one, any given time, because there are many of them. And so we really wanna just focus on uh, how executive functions are impacting the writing process. But if you wanna know more about this, I'll be happy to post a PowerPoint that talks more about what executive functions are and, and how to think about them. Uh, these, the supervisor system of the brain, as I mentioned, self-regulation is really the focus when we're writing. But when kids get to the age of 10 to 14, we really have to start thinking about self-determination and self-realization. Uh, between 10 and 14, uh, children wake up, become aware of things that are around them uh, and, and realize, you know, they want, to, they want to be their own boss. They want to do what they want to do. And beyond that point, you have to negotiate with a brain that's, that's now self-determined uh, because they have their own agenda. And so when writing comes into play here and you're asking individuals to write beyond the age of 10 to 14, uh, it has to fit with their goals. And so we have, we have to talk a lot about motivation related to writing. But that's not going to be our topic tonight. But it's just it, it plays a big role. And so this when I talk about executive functions in general, you know, we, we really have to think about these these aspects of, uh, of executive control beyond self-regulation um, and the supervisor system of the brain in, involves in these aspects. And, and uh, sometimes I'll ju I'm just going to show you a few of these slides that are have uh, printing on them. And I'm going to move forward till we get to the point where we have some with diagrams. I'll stay here and I'll talk a little bit about this from the diagram and then we'll move forward a few slides because what follows is what I just said, but written out in format so that you can look at it later on and, and uh, you know, be able to re, you know, recount what I've said. And also it'll be written out so you can understand it even if you haven't listened to the, to the talk. Uh, so we have the workers here in the brain. And, and when you're in school, interestingly, you know, a lot of the learning that, that students are doing, new learning is teacher directed. And so that supervisory system is the teacher. The teacher is really taking control and really driving the, the educational process here with new learning. And some teachers are so good at that, that even students with severe executive function difficulties can, can sit and learn in those classrooms because the teacher is so good at becoming the supervisory system uh, for all those little frontal lobes in the room. Uh, and so and, but that's, in, that's in a teaching situation. Unfortunately, what we see then is when it comes time for self-directed production, when we ask students now, you've learned these things, now show me what you've learned. And they have to take a test or they have to do an assignment, they have to do a writing assignment or a project that involves writing. Now it's up to them to produce. And the problem here is that the teacher is no longer uh, you know, directing those frontal lobes to do the production. And so the individual is now on their own. So now we've got, we're back to the students uh, executive control supervisory system that's so supposed to be running those workers. And if we haven't really made them aware of what they need to do and how they need to do it, uh, a lot of kids are kind of dead in the water at this point because they really don't know what to do with their supervisory system, how to get it to, to manage the workers so that they can get that production that we're looking for from them. And so what we see then here is a situation where we have a difference here between learning and producing. And learning is what's happening you know, when you're learning. And unfortunately, we can't see learning taking place. Teachers are good at guiding the learning process, but you know, the only way they know whether you're really learning or not is when they get you to try to do something and that's producing. And that's when you're on your own. And so they're very, two very, very different things. And if you have difficulties here now, you know, individual learning and, and producing difficulties are usually the first to be noticed in school because teachers don't refer on learning problems because you can't see them, they, re they refer on lack of production. And so if you are not producing very early on in kindergarten or first grade, uh, a teacher is going to refer you and we find a learning disability and we say, well, uh, that's why they weren't producing. But really it's not, that's not the case because learning difficulties and dis disabilities and producing disabilities are a little different. Uh, learning is more about the workers and whether the workers, you know, if you have deficiencies in the workers, if your phonological processing is, is poor, um, or you have visual spatial difficulties, right? Those are workers that are supposed to be doing their job. And in interventions for, for learning problems, what we do is we tend to focus on that on, on those workers and strengthen them. And now they can do their job and now the supervisor system can take over. And that producing under the supervisor system is a little different than the learning. So you, if you have individuals in the middle here that have both, the IEP should really be written to address both learning and producing difficulties. Uh, but often it's just written for the learning problems because we think that's the root of the, of the problem. Uh, but the reality is, you know, there, there are two separate things. And then we see individuals that do well on those evaluations that we do. They get referred for producing difficulties, but we don't see any problems. They have uh, fairly good cognitive abilities. Uh, they have good achievement scores in certain areas. And we think, well, there's really not a problem here. But the real problem is they're failing everything in school. They're not doing their assignments. So when you see that, you realize that we have producing difficulties here. And unfortunately, 
well, if, if you if you look good on paper in, in tests, then we say, well, uh, I get it. He's, he's lazy, unmotivated, could do if he wanted to. But the reality is it's not that that's not the issue for a lot of these individuals. It's really that they don't know how to get the production from themselves. They're not able to use that supervisor system effectively, don't even know what it is. Uh, and so they're they're kind of stuck. And so we really have to have uh, strategies for addressing their problems and addressing those producing difficulties. And unfortunately, right now in schools, very often, the only way you're going to get a, a producing difficulty identified is if you're ADHD. Uh, there are some, some school districts a little bit more enlightened that, that appreciate executive functions and, and executive function problems and will give an IEP or a 504 accommodation if you just have those difficulties but aren't ADHD. Uh, very often I've run into situations where you really have to be ADHD before they'll recognize and acknowledge that they're producing difficulties. When you have a writing disability, very often it's not so much that you haven't learned how to write because that's, that's a, uh, you know, seeing what writing is about is not that difficult. It's what's difficult is getting your brain to do do it, getting the supervisory system to run your workers so that they'll actually produce something. And that, that's more likely the case in, in writing. And we'll talk about that more extensively. Uh, when you only have learning difficulties, appreciate that if you have a difficulty, uh, you know, like phonological processing that, that will produce difficulties in both reading and writing, uh, and you get the right intervention and you get that fixed up, then you're going to be able to produce if you have no producing difficulties. And unfortunately, uh, many individuals with learning difficulties only can hide their disability for a long time because they understand the idea of production. They get something on the page and we assume they don't have a disability until I see them in middle school or high school when the parents are saying, but they're, these, these strategies they're using are so convoluted and they're spending so much time doing their homework. I know they're getting A's and B's and you know sometimes C's, but you don't understand how hard it is for them to do this. I think they have a learning disability. And because they're getting possibly good grades, we say, well, we don't think they really do. So that group, I do work with individuals who have learning difficulties only. But tonight, we're really going to be talking about individuals who have made learning and producing difficulties or more just producing difficulties. So the basic uh, capacity to write is there, but the production, their ability to write uh, when on demand, you know, when others are asking to do it, is very poor. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, then the interventions here, the interventions for the workers, strengthening the workers for learning disabilities, and for producing, it's strengthening the supervisory system. And if you have both, then you have to have inter interventions that are going to be working on both strengthening the workers at younger ages and then st strengthening the supervisory system, especially as you get into middle school and high school. Uh, but even in elementary school, we should be working on this. And so with writing, as I said, with writing disabilities, many individuals fall in that middle category or they fall in that producing difficulties only when you see writing problems. And that's that lack of production. They're not writing when they're supposed to. Uh, and now I want to switch a little bit here and talk about some of the first stages of learning to write. Uh, before that supervisor system gets, gets involved, there's something called system one and system two thinking that, that Daniel Kahneman talked about, uh, Nobel, winning, uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist. And, and he talks about system one thinking, which is fast, effortless, and automatic. It doesn't involve a lot of supervising. Uh, systems because the workers are pretty much doing what they're supposed to do and they do it so well and so effectively they don't need to be supervised very much and so we do a lot of things on automatic pilot automaticity there's just things that you've learned automaticity that you're able to do and you don't really think about it uh, now when you have to engage your frontal lobes and supervise what you're doing this is called system two thinking and it's slow effortful and not automatic and many many students want to stay on that fast effortless automatic pattern uh, or, or way of thinking because it doesn't burn a lot of energy. When you are trying to slow down, be effortful and not automatic and really engage your supervisor system, it burns a lot of energy in the frontal lobe and it's hard to do. And kids perceive this as being very difficult, very challenging, and so they wanna try to avoid it. And, and unfortunately, if you haven't learned anything related to writing and you haven't gotten the handwriting aspect to automaticity, uh, then writing is going to be extremely challenging for you. So the first stage of writing is really getting that hand to move across the page to write those letters. You know, when you're first learning how to write letters, it's a lot of effort. There's lots of slow, effortful, not automatic thinking till kids figure out how to write those letters, right? And they're down there and, and they're, if you got three or four letters at age five and you're exhausted, right? It's just really hard to do that. Um, and your supervisor system is working really hard to get those things on the page and the tongue is out and they're just, you know, working real hard. Uh, but, you know, the idea here is that you need to buy by the time you're in first grade and heading into second grade, the, the, your handwriting should be so, so automatic that you don't have to think about it. As adults, when we take notes, 
uh, we don't have to think about taking notes, right? We pick up the pencil and we write our thoughts and, and they appear on the page like magic. But when you're five years old, it's just learning how to write the letters that's, you know, you have to automate. And so when, when kids are learning very initially how to, how to make the letters and how to write, uh, they've got to get that automated as quickly as possible. And so when you're heading into second grade and you haven't automated the handwriting process, uh, then you get into second, third, fourth grade. We really should be thinking about finding a way to get that that system, you know, they, they get those ideas out of your head, uh, through your hand into a medium you can share with others. And if you haven't been able to master that in holding a pen or a pencil, then we have to think about things like keyboarding. Uh, you know, if you can't if you can't handle a pencil, at least you can find the buttons and push them. And even if you can't do that, then you, we might have to rely on opposable thumbing. There are some individuals I know that can text with their thumbs, uh, but they cannot use a keyboard and, and use all 10 fingers. And so we're just trying to find a way for them to get that information out of their head and automate that process of, of, of using, you know, of a way to get that, those, that information out of your head and into a medium you can share with others. And that's that first stage of writing. And, and so we want to get that automated as much as possible. Uh, so we have to move from, you know, figuring out what and when to do things with a new task to practicing what when and how to automaticity. And basically it's hard at first, but the more you practice it, the less executive energy you have to burn to do it. And then when it's actually automated, you're not burning any executive energy at all. And now you can use your executive uh, supervisory system, you know, to process the thoughts. What do I want to write about? That's the, that, what you should be thinking about your, what you're, when you're writing is what should I be writing? What do I want to write about? Not how do I move my hand here? How do I make a B? How do I make a D? How do I spell this word? See, those are questions that you shouldn't be uh, burning energy to answer. Those are things that should be automated in your brain. Of course, spelling is not really automated well into middle school, high school. And some individuals even have difficulty with it you know, that are not disabled, uh, difficulty with spelling even beyond that. So that, that comes a little later, but moving the hand should be automated by the time you're in second grade. And if it's not, you're burning a lot of frontal lobe energy just to get the words on the page. And that's going to reduce the amount of energy you have and the amount of supervisory system you have to devote to the idea of what do I want to say and what I want to get on the page as far as my thoughts. Uh, but we're, so we're trying to, to automate that as much as possible. Of course, these are the things that we, we teach to automaticity in elementary school. Uh, and, and of course, graphomotor functioning and that quick writing of, uh, of your letters and words is something that we do want to definitely automate uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and then, um, it, 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 so, so figure out what, what to do, as I mentioned, you know, with it. But then there's this also situation here where uh, if you're taking a test, uh, so there's some things you can learn to automaticity, but even, even though you've automated some aspects of it, if you don't uh, bring your supervisor system on, then when you take a test or when you're doing a project, uh, you're not going to get it right. So you can't just rely on that automated process. You have to engage some aspect of, of supervision of the writing process here to get assignments completed or to get tests done, you know, to write essays during a test. And so uh, many students I've found, sometimes they'll try to memorize everything they need to know and they'll try to have it in their head and they'll have all that stuff in there. So they think they can, they can be an automatic pilot when they go to take a test and they'll just be a brain dump. But the reality is it, it often isn't. You have to stop and think about the question and assemble your answer in your mind as you're thinking about it and then write on it. And so very often when you have to do those kind of uh, short essays uh, for, you know, for answering test questions or do a uh, do an assignment that involves an essay, uh, individuals don't understand and realize the extent to which they have to bring that executive function component back online, at least to some degree, because they've automated some elements of it, but not all of it. And you can't automate all of it. And that's, that's a major problem. So uh, I have to always have to, teaching strategies to individuals that enable them to understand that and bring those executive capacities online when they need them so they can they can size up, you know, what is it, what's being asked here and, and uh, what do I know about this topic now? How do I write about what I know and, and developing strategies for enabling them to do that? And that that's going to involve the supervisory system. It can't just be an automatic pilot. Uh, so we, we are talking about here the difference between knowing when and knowing how. And I, I would suggest to you that there's a lot of aspects of knowing how that can be automated. So the workers learn how to do things. Uh, the skill manager supervises them very effectively. They practice and now they can do it very well. But the executive function component is about knowing when. Uh, when should you be doing certain things with your brain? When you should be when should you be bringing certain workers online and using them? And that can never be automated because the demands on your brain are always changing. The environment is always changing. So you have to have that aspect of, uh, of executive functions. They're ready to go uh, so that you can figure out what those task demands are and, and produce on them uh, by external demand. Uh, and, and so executive control and writing, you know, how does, what does, what is this uh, executive control of writing about? Well, it's about cueing, directing, and coordinating 
all those different aspects of writing that you have to do, uh, all those different workers. And so I have a model here that I use for my assessments and, and writing starts with working memory and it starts in your mind. It doesn't start with picking up the pencil and starting to write. It, it starts with what you're thinking about. And of course, in order to hold information and manipulate it in mind as you think about it, you have to have some pretty good working memory. So very often, weak working memory will be the basis of, of many writing problems. Uh, so individuals who, who can't hold and manipulate information in mind are going to be, you know, their workers are deficient here. And so it's trying to strengthen those workers through strategy uh, instruction. In other words, uh, in this situation, not so much that you're going to improve the worker's ability to do the job. It's more that you're going to teach them compensatory strategies or bring other workers on board to help them out. And so we often teach a lot of strategies for dealing with working memory problems that will enable you to, you know, get your thoughts down on paper, make an outline, uh, just dump the information in your mind and write, write little sentence fragments and then, and then organize those later because to hold them in working memory and do that all at once is very difficult and very challenging for many individuals. And of course, it starts with a thought in your head. You have to have an idea that you're going to write about, but that idea may be visual images in your mind. You may not be thinking about it in terms of words, so you have to turn that idea into, into words. Virginia Berner says, what I think I can say. So you have to be able to turn that, that idea into language, and when you, once you have language, now you have to think about um, you know, well, what words are you going to use uh, in, in the language that you're using to describe that idea? Well, the answer is only the words you know. Uh, and so for some individuals, you know, they're, they, they have a very limited vocabulary. And so the words they use are the ones they know. So increasing your vocabulary and your, your, uh, your knowledge of words is going to help individuals have more language available to them that they can write about. And of course, what are you writing about? Well, if you don't know anything about the topic you're writing about, you need to do some research. So very often with this individuals, I have to say, now, what do you know about that topic? And, and when that, that list is very short, we have to go, well, you have to, that's not going to get three paragraphs or four paragraphs. So let's Let's go back here and read some more or do some more research and learn more about those, those, that topic so you can have more language to talk about with that topic and now you can write about it. Uh, and of course, you know, are you writing to create an image in someone's mind as they read it? That's visual spatial translation of language, or are you trying to create an, a, 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 a paragraph that can be understood logically, you know, using reasoning? So these abilities come into play when you're writing as well. And all that is happening in the head before you pick up the pencil. And this is part of the, you know, demystifying the writing process for students I work with is explaining to them all these things that have to happen in your head before you pick up the pencil and, and kind of getting developing strategies for doing that kind of thinking ahead of time. Uh, and then you pick up the pencil and start writing. And now you can see what you're writing. And so now as you, as you are, you know, moving your hand across the page and creating those images, you know, are you doing that well and effectively? These processes are involved in that. And if any of these processes are deficient, then you have workers that aren't able to do the job of actually getting that, that hand to write the information that you, that you want to get on the page. And so that's that source of disabilities, those workers that are very weak in terms of the writing process. And of course, then their skills, if you have those processes intact or we can strengthen them to the point where you can write, then we're teaching you how to generate text. Uh, you know, through you have to learn how to how to transcribe and spell words, and you have to learn how to generate text. Uh, you know, what does a good sentence look like, and how do you write a well written sentence? And then you have to get that production, you know, automatic as automatic as possible. So then you can think your thoughts, and you can turn them into well written sentences or or well thought out sentences that can be turned into well written sentences. And of course, the first pass on many sentences isn't very good. No matter how good a writer you think you are, the first time you write a sentence, you're probably going to want to fix it up. And so we learn how to edit and revise our work. And these those those round circles in the middle there are really the skills that we try to teach when we're teaching writing. And so we have those, those abilities and, and knowledge bases above that top line that have to come into play. Then we have the processes below that bottom line that have to come into play to get things on the page. Uh, and then you have to teach how to really strengthen that whole system. And where executive function in this? Well, executive functions are where you see red arrows in this model. In other words, they're responsible for cueing and coordinating the efforts of all these different aspects of writing abilities, processes, skills. Um, you know, they're all, they all have to be involved in writing. All these are different workers. And I have to evaluate whether all these workers are doing their job. If they are, you may still not be writing well because the executive system is not able to command those workers, direct them, cue them, and coordinate them so that you have this writing product that looks good. And so from very a many a number of individuals that I work with, I will do an evaluation. And many of these components look fine when you look at them individually. But when they're asked to do a writing assignment, there is no production. And that's, that's when you know that there's an executive function 
problem, uh, you know, at heart here. And so uh, in, in the next slides, I just have some information about the neuropsychology of writing that you can read, you know, at your leisure here, because we do not have a, all the time here to do that. <laughs> We're actually getting a little short on time as we move forward here. Um, and so it's just, you can, you can read these, but you know, it's a process of learning, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there's that first stage of automaticity of the handwriting process, but then there's all these other aspects of writing that have to come into play that we have to be, you know, learning hopefully through instruction, but not always. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to do that aspect of revising and, and reviewing your work. And, you know, there's a shift here now from just writing to really thinking about what you're writing and, and revising it, what doesn't look right. And those are editing skills that have to be learned. Uh, and then to that, that shift in executive control from, you know, from uh, managing your hand and getting automated to managing your ideas and pre-planning and doing things that will help you become a better writer. That's where the focus of executive functions are. And sometimes we create constraints on the writing process for students. Um, and, and other the way we test sometimes and the way the assignments that we assign uh, can be overburdening to individuals that have writing difficulties. If we place so many constraints on how we want them to do things, uh, then sometimes it's hard for them to do. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I've had tests where uh, I've been given spaces like this and it's, they say, write your answer inside the box. And you have to appreciate that if you're given that, that challenge, right? That, and, 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 uh, and you're asked to do that, you now have an, an additional executive function demand, which is how do I fit my thoughts in that box? How do I make sure that I write small enough so I get all my ideas in there? Uh, and that that's, you know, an unnecessary addition to the writing challenge that you gave them is like how to fit it in the box. And so uh, and I had a great example of this. I was driving to uh, uh, to Toronto for a vacation one summer with my family. And and there was we were passing this little town called Loyal Sock, Pennsylvania. And there was a sign out there and uh, and the sign, uh, you know, was at a gas station and it said summer time is oil change time and i'm thinking wow that's very deep you know I'm, i wonder if this guy meditates you know this is a mantra that i could use for meditation and you know something to kind of like think about and then and then the more i thought about it it's like now this outside of a gas station and then the reality is this is you know this isn't what he wanted to say uh but he had big letters and he had this sign it's like how do i get my message on this sign so people understand it and the answer is not really so well because what he really wanted to say is summertime is oil change time uh, and so how do you use that, you know, these constraints that we place on, on uh, the aspect of production can get in the way and, and make it even more difficult for individuals. So when I'm working with teachers, I try to help them understand, okay, it's hard enough for individuals to write. Can we reduce the number of constraints we place on that, that writing assignment so that they're able to utilize their writing skills and not have to work so hard with their executive functions just to figure out how to get something on the page? Um, and so really it's that idea, you know, sometimes you have this, these no guidelines for the writing product, but then you have an extensive list of detailed constraints on what you're going to do with your writing. And it's so detailed that you kind of get lost in it. And so it's really finding that balance, you know, a few guidelines and suggestions, and then some specific uh, uh, suggestion about writing strategy that can be used to complete the assignment. And, you know, there's that, that balance that we're looking for so that we don't overload individuals, especially those with writing disabilities, uh, because sometimes the, the, the challenge of, of answering the questions or doing the assignment, you know, is just much larger than it needs to be. Uh, and these are behaviors indicative of poor executive control in writing. And again, you've probably seen all of these or, or know about them. So I'm going to just pass over these, but you can take a look at this list. But this is, you know, they're, they're all the things that we see when there's, uh, you know, uh, these are the behaviors that you see in, in children when they're not able to write very well. And when there is often when there's disability involved or when there's a lack of supervisory system here uh, that enables them to write well, these are things that are going to be problems for them. Uh, and that, the, you know, that not just the resistance, but just the inability to write and produce on, on demand is, you know, one of the biggest ones that I see. It's just there. It's just overwhelming for them. And there's often a, a large emotional component that it kicks in. And now there's resistance to the writing process because it's so hard to do. And the reality is you're going to become a good writer or overcome this disability. The thing that's the hardest for you to do is the thing that you have to do the most. Uh, there's really no good interventions for writing difficulties or the supervisory system other than writing more. The more you write, the better at it you get. It's like, right, you know, get on the bike, start pedaling, and I'll give you feedback about how well you're doing. So practice and rehearsal with feedback about the accuracy of performance is one of the best ways for inter to intervene with a writing problem. Uh, get the individual engaged in writing to the best they can, help them improve that, but help them do it as much as possible. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But one of the things I would like to share with you is that I have helped many individuals, you know, when you think about that diagram I showed you, 
where those red arrows are with all the executive control. Uh, how, do, how can I reduce the executive control demands in a situation to get individuals to start writing? And one of the ways that I have found is to, and is to allow individuals to simply copy good writing. Uh, you know, think about it. When we when we first learn how to play music, we don't force individuals to write their own compositions and then play those. We get the individual to practice the compositions of other individuals. The same thing should be the case with writing. You're not going to start off writing well written sentences and compose them yourself. You should learn how to write well sentences, well written sentences by copying well written sentences. So find the things that they like to read about the most or most interested in. Try to help them read about those things and then say, "Oh, that's I love the way they said that. They're really well." written sentence why don't you copy that sentence because it's so well written and the more you copy well written sentences appreciate that you're beginning to develop an understanding of what a well written sentence looks like and how to produce one and you're starting to understand writer's voice and how to start developing it in your own mind and so i've helped a number of individuals by getting them on board because copying is a lot easier than writing your own thoughts so I can't get you to produce your own thoughts immediately. How about you just copy someone else's thoughts? Now, if you're worried about plagiarism, then teach them about plagiarism, put quotation marks around that, you know, and note who that author of that, of that thought was, that's fine. But get them to practice copying first before you get them to write their own thoughts, because that's a much more difficult stage and it requires much more supervisory uh, system involvement to do that than to simply copy. And now that you start automating that copying of, of well-written thoughts, now you see, you know, you're starting to automate that process of, of how to write a well-written sentence. And now it's going to be a lot easier for you to start thinking about your own thoughts and put them into, into sentences that could be well-written. And of course, then, uh, you know, uh, you want editing that, to get to that point as well. Uh, so all these things are difficulty, difficult behaviors for individuals. And I've described them in my book, you know, on this. And, and think about writing as a hierarchical or a holarchical process instead of a hierarchy. You know, the idea of a hierarchy, first you have, a good, have to have a good idea. And then you turn that into language and language has to be really good. And now that you're thinking really good language, you can pick up that pencil and you can write a really well-written sentence. Uh, and then after that, you might have to do just a little editing and revising and you follow through those stages and, and you don't go to the next stage until the first stage is done. But the reality is writing is not so much a hierarchy like that, because if you if you do that, some individuals are stuck with the idea that they have to form a uh, they have to do an outline before they start writing. Well, it's good to do that if you can. But if you can't, sometimes it's just better to start writing. If you have an idea. Good. Just. Well, turn into language. Now, just put it on the page. Now, go back and think about how you can have better language, or maybe you can fix up and have a better idea. So in a holarchy instead of a hierarchy, there are stages, but the stages are, are enfolded here. They're transcendent and include. And at any given point in time, you can stop and go back and fix up previous stages. It's not like you stay at one stage until you're ready to move to the next one. You can move through these stages quickly, but then just go back and start fixing them up. So it's like multiple iterations through the same process of, you know, of generating your text and editing and revising. And now go back, let's do that again. And you can go through that process as many times and move forward or backward in the process, you know, and it gives, it gives writers a, a lot of a leeway here with how they structure their writing product. And so I often have to talk about these stages and say, you know, you know we can move forward, but you can always come back and fix that up later. Don't worry about it now. Let's just get something on the page and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll redo this and rethink this later on. And it helps a lot of individuals that have writer's block that just can't get started. Uh, and of course, that that idea is the first one. And I like Virginia uh, Bernier's mantra here. She says, you know, take that first stage idea generation, what I think I can say. Uh, and then, you know, that's idea to language, what I think idea, I can say language, what I say I can write. So language to text generation. Uh, and that's kind of demystifying it for five, six year olds. Like, what I think I can say, what I say I can write. Of course, then first you have to think it. Then you have to say it to yourself, and then you have to write it. Uh, but of course, you have to have that automated text transcription ability in between there. Otherwise, you can think it, but it's not, and, and you can say it to yourself, but it's not coming out of your pencil. And so we have to add that automated process of being able to write or, or keyboard or opposable thumb so that you can get to that text generation stage. And then I would add to Virginia Bernier's mantra, what I think I can say what I say I can write and what I can write, I can fix up because you always need to fix it up. It's not going to come out of your pencil fully formed a perfect sentence. You should reread it and then think about it. Is that what I wanted to say? If it's not, then how would you fix it up so that it is what you wanted to say? So editing and revising is always critical here. And it's something that should be taught from the, from the early stages, uh, you know, to, to move forward with this. 
Uh, and that's on, on the whole arc. And here's an example of uh, an Evan. This is what Evan wrote. I often give the Wyatt uh, as a test and it's and and you have to write an essay in it and one of the, the essay is on my favorite game is and now you write about your favorite game and you can see here he can't spell very well well his, his game is marble rolling uh and this is how he's spelling and it's very limited and there's not much production there he's 10 years old and so this is what he wrote and you could tell i could tell he's very frustrated with it. i said now um you didn't write a whole lot and he said no and i said well is this what you wanted to write? And he said, no. And I said, well, what did you, what did you want to write? Just tell me what you wanted to write. And, and I, you know, and I'll write it. And so I'm scribing for him. And this is what, so this is what he said. And this is what I scribed. And you can see his language is much better developed than his, than what he got on the page. And so this is an individual who can think the thought and can express the language, but can't follow through. And his text transcription skills were good. It's just that point of getting those ideas on the page out of his head and onto the page, even though he could move his hand well, uh, because his spelling was so poor, he often avoided words that he knew he wanted to use, but didn't know how to spell. And so I had to help him out with that, about the idea of invented spellings, you know, take a shot at it. And then uh, I will give you immediate feedback about fixing up that misspelled word. As you as you write it, I'll say, now, what word is that that you wanted to, to write? Now, let's look it up and see how you spell it correctly. So invented spellings are OK, but they should be corrected quickly, as, as quickly as possible. You can't leave them on the page. And I I, I walk into schools and I sometimes I see, you know, uh, uh, writing assignments on the walls with lots of invented misspellings. And it's not good to leave the invented misspellings misspelled. You really need to get feedback about how to spell the word accurately. No, that's not that's not how you spell it. Here's how you spell it. I'm going to write it out for you. Now you copy that, and now that's how you spell that word. So you really have to work on that. So with Evan, we we really had to work. His his stage was improving his spelling, but also uh, taking the risk of of trying to spell words as closely as he could get them to, so a spell checker could recognize them, uh, and and not be afraid to use words that he didn't know initially, because we could always go back and fix that up. Uh, but you could see that he has a lot of language. He just was not able to produce on that language. Uh, and of course, executive control, there's a maturational component here. Uh, you need to, you know, your frontal lobes are, if you're not utilizing them and using them a lot in the writing process, then they're underutilized. So it's a lack, you think a lack of maturation often due to a lack of use. If you don't use these abilities in your brain, they don't start maturing as effectively and as quickly as you'd want them to. The more you use them, the more you, you learn how to use them uh, and engage them, the more you're going to start developing them. And so you could be behind simply because you're avoiding the writing process. Uh, and the only way to kind of fix that maturation lag is to get individuals involved. However, uh, I think Virginia Berninger makes some good, you know, some good points here where she says, you know, it's not just mat brain maturation alone that's going to get you to that point where you can self-regulate your, your, your ability to write. You really need to learn strategies. And if you don't have anyone teaching you strategies, uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult. So, you know, a combination there. Uh, first, let me teach you the strategies. Now, let's start using those strategies. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. And the more you do it, the more your supervisory system is going to under start understanding what it's supposed to do in the writing process. But if you don't write and never write, it's not going to happen for you. But I can appreciate that many individuals avoid the writing because they don't have strategies that they can use. So there's really the key is really is, is learning the strategy that you need. And, and that's really the most effective way to do this. And so, uh, you know, I, I was working with an, a young boy named Brett and, and his teacher, he's oppositional defiant. I ask him to write and he just refuses and, and I, he gets very angry. And sometimes I think he's going to, you know, he may get so, uh, so uh, angry that he might hit me. And so she's just really afraid of this kid. And she's, and so I, I'm, I'm doing an observation while she's doing a writing lesson. And, and now I want you, she has the students, I want you to write about something you did this summer that was fun. And, uh, and she talks about that a little bit with the students and everybody picks up their pencil, thinks about it, and they start writing. And Brett's sitting there with his arms folded. No, he's not going to write. And the teacher said, Brett, you know, could you please write something about what you did this summer? Uh, and he says, no. And she said to him, so there's, there's nothing you can think of that was fun this summer that you did that you could write about. No. And, uh, and so then she tried what I often talk about, which is try to align the external demands with the internal desires. So she said to him, um, well, Brett, uh, you don't have to write about what you did this summer if you don't want to. Is there anything that you'd like to write about? You can write about anything you want to, you know, whatever you'd like to write about. Is there anything you, you can think of that you'd like to write about? And he said, no. <laughs> so now it's like, she just looked at me like, what else do I do? It's kind of, you know, we're done here. And so now the, op the observation is over. And so I go over, Brett, uh, uh, Philadelphia Eagles t-shirt. Do you like the Eagles? Yes, I do. Uh, wow, they got a game this Sunday? Yeah. Who are they playing? Oh, the Giants, that's going to be a good game, isn't it? And we're talking football and he's having a great time talking about football. And I said to him, oh, you, you know a lot about football, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, why don't you write about football? 
and he wrote five paragraphs for me. So the, the reality here is that Brett wasn't being oppositional defiant. He was struggling with the executive demands of the writing process. The teacher said, is there any thought in your head right now that you could write on? And he was honestly responding, no, I have no thought in my head right now. And so the reality is you, you, with, without a thought, you can't move forward to the language. And so we talked about this, you know, I came over, I talked, we talked about the, the Philadelphia Eagles, and now I gave you an idea, and you had language that you could use, and now once you had the language in your head, it wasn't hard for you to write, it's just you didn't even know that you needed to get that idea in your head in the first place. So we talked about strategies that he could use. And, and um, you know, I said, you know, well, now if you're stuck with the writing process here, and you have no ideas, you know, what could you do? And we he said, You'd ask the teacher, you'd ask the teacher, you know, could you talk with me for a minute? Because when you talk to me, I get idea and I could write about that idea. So that's a good strategy. But what if the teacher's busy? I could talk to my friend, Tommy. That, you, can I talk to Tommy? Because when I talk to Tommy, I get ideas. That's a great idea too. But there's a third one. And, and he had a real hard time with that. I said, you know, just couldn't come up with it. I said, you know, that conversation that you and I had, I said, well, you could have it with yourself inside your own head. It's like, whoa, you know, never thought about that in grade four. And it's like, whoa, you said, yeah, you know, writers talk to themselves all the time. Some of them like, you know, uh, they, they lock themselves in a cabin for six months and talk to themselves and write a book. And he said, that's just so weird. I said, yeah, but this is what they do. Writers talk to themselves. And so you could have these conversations in your own head, you know, metacognition, thinking about your own thinking. So it's that sometimes it's that is demystifying this process of what is it that you're supposed to be doing in your head. And for Brett, it was that inability to generate ideas. So it wasn't that he was refusing to write. It's that he, he had no idea. And he had to learn some strategies and ways to generate ideas. And so for Brett, uh, he had to write a report. So I'm helping with the strategy for writing the report. Uh, and so the strategy I found here uh, is that, um, you know, in, in Steve Graham here, Best Practice in Writing Instruction, a great book with lots of good strategy suggestions. And Steve Graham came up with the idea of self-regulated strategy development back in the 1980s. And he's been working on it ever since. And it's one of the most effective ways for teaching students how to write. And it's described here in this book, the third edition of it. Uh, and I had the second edition at the time. And so the, and, and uh, this is cognitive strategy instruction. You explain the purpose, you model the strategy. This is the general, you know, strategy you use for every strategy, which is uh, you explain the purpose, model the strategy, have the students memorize the steps or write them down. And, you know, I want you to write these steps down, put them in your binder. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll remind you, cue you to use those steps because some students just can't memorize them. But if you use it a lot, you might memorize it. So I just make sure that they have the steps written down. And then uh, now I want you, let's, let's, you take this writing assignment and let's walk through the steps here. And sometimes, oh, you know what? I thought there were only four steps in this strategy. For you, there's really five steps. There's a step between one and two that I have to teach you. So let's now make it a five set step strategy instead of four. So you have, sometimes you have to break it apart and make sure that there's enough steps there for the individual to follow. And once you get that in place, now they have a strategy that works for them. Now you say, now I want you to use that strategy and I'll let you use it. And then you and I will talk about it afterwards. And we'll just, you know, we'll collaboratively look at what you did here and we'll figure out how, how well you did it and where you have to fix things up. So these are the six steps in, in, in cognitive, cognitive strategy instruction, no matter what the strategy is. And so uh, I'm using a, a, a strategy with Brett out of the book. But here's the thing. The book did not start with number one. Uh, in the book, number two was number one, brainstorm what you know and what you want to learn. But see, for Brett, this is a problem because if, if Brett doesn't have some, you know, you can't brainstorm an idea you don't have. So for Brett, I had to I had to scaffold this and make a number one, which is first you need to get a topic, right? If you don't have a topic, you can't brainstorm. So make sure that you do that thing we talked about, which is talk to your teacher, talk to a friend or talk, you know, or talk to yourself. Uh, and to, so you get a topic. Now, once you have the topic, now you can brainstorm. And now you can, and now let's talk about organizing in a visual web. You know, I wonder, and this is from the book. Do you want to write about lemurs? What do you know about them? Well, that's not a lot. So let's go back here and, and do some research about them so we can fill in your, your outline here. Uh, and then you now you gather new information, you revise your visual web, you use the web to help construct an outline for the report. And then you review, plan, revise as you write. Now, number seven is a really tough one for a lot of kids. And, and, they were, it, and it was for Brett, too. But I, I, we said, well, let's just try that, you know, the way it is. And then the, the strategy in the book ends with number eight. Check the visual web. Did you write what you wanted to write? And that's the end. See, and unfortunately, that's not the end, because if the answer to number eight is no, 
you've still got work to do. So I had to add number nine here, which is uh, if the answer to, to nine is uh, to eight is no, it's not what I wanted to write. Then you have to add information that's missing and fix sentences that don't say what you want to say. And of course, he said to me, how do I do that? So now we have a little sub strategy to do that. So here are the steps that I taught him, you know, read now. Let's take what you wrote. Let's read each sentence silently or aloud to me. Does that sentence make sense? Is it what you wanted to say? Uh, is that what you meant to say? If it's not, you know, what does that mean? Oh, is that what you wanted to say? No. What's missing? What doesn't make sense? Okay. Now, now, now that you know what's wrong with that, let's try to stay, say what you wanted to say, but say it in a better way. And now, okay, that's good. Now that's a good sentence. Now repeat that to yourself. Now let's try to write what you just said. And now let's go through that with every sentence that you wrote. And interestingly, you know, this is a strategy that I taught to a fourth grader and he used it fairly well. Uh, but this is, a, this is a strategy I have to teach to my graduate students at times because writing a, a dissertation is just like writing a report in fourth grade. It's just a lot bigger project, but you still do the same steps and you still have to go through the same process. So I use this strategy with individuals who just struggle with writing and, and I'm responsible as director of research, I'm responsible for dissertations uh, for all the dissertations in the department. I've chaired many of them, but about 40% of them that have been done. And you know, with my students, I, I need to teach them the writing process sometimes you need a strategy here for doing this and if you don't have it you're not going to finish and so I, I really I, I have to teach how to write to individuals that are in their 20s because they actually didn't they didn't learn these kind of strategies when they were going through middle school or high school or even college and so now I'm teaching in graduate school uh, but you have to do what you have to do so just real quickly here looking at um, uh, at, at, a, at a, a case here, another case, I want to just show you George, and you can read, I've, I've put slides at the end here that kind of write out what I did with George, but if you just look what he, what he did here, he had a really hard time writing, and, and it was, he had severe ADHD, and he was avoiding the writing process, and the more you avoid it, the, the, the worse it's going to get for you, so I had to engage him, but he was resisting writing, so I engaged him with, a, and I, first, this is what his writing looked like when I met him, he's in, he's in November first grade, and he's not able to automate uh, the alphabet writing yet, uh, he's, you know, he's making letters poorly, and, and he's reversing his Z, and he hasn't automated, and he said, I could do better than that, I said, well, okay, uh, why don't you try that again? And that's what he wrote the second time. And it was just as bad as the first time. And he was so frustrated with it, he just scribbled it out. And this is what he often would do. He'd try to write and then he'd just get so frustrated, he'd just scribble the page, ball it up and throw it away. And so I knew if I tried to make him write, I was going to get nowhere. So we started our intervention with, with strengthening the, ox, the uh, occipital temporal region of his brain, which is where the visual input is for orthography. Orthography is the visual image of written words. If that area of the brain, if those workers are weak, then you really aren't seeing what's on the page effectively and you don't store it effectively. So when I ask you to, to draw up an image of a word and now spell that word from memory, it, it just isn't there for you to do that. So I knew I knew he was very weak with that because I gave him some, some test of orthographic processing. And so I wanted to strengthen that. So I strengthened that process with him. Uh, you know, the frontal lobes, the occipital lobes are what have to be strengthened here and processing letters and words. That's the occipital temporal region there in green. And I don't want this other area over here that doesn't process words involved. But very often when we assess this visual processing, we do it with, to a task like this, which is not good because there's no letters or words there. I have to assess you using letters and words. I can't assess you using non-visual patterns. Uh, and so that wasn't good. So what I did instead with this visual perception test where you find the letters that are reversed and you circle them. Uh, and so now I'm getting you to discriminate between letters that are that are well formed and letters that aren't well formed. And, and let's see how fast you can do this. And he loved the idea of a challenge here. Uh, and so now this was, you know, find those letters. And, and the first time he did it, he only he found only three letters in 15 seconds and he didn't find them by scanning left to right major problem here, right? So we got to get this whole thing down about, and I said, let's try that again, 60 seconds. He found 11 letters, but he still didn't scan left to right. So we're teaching now how to scan left to right, how to find the letters that are missing, and let's see how fast you can do this and how many you could do it. And of course, after I did it, he added three because he's very competitive, you know, and he wanted his score to be as high as possible. So I knew this is my hook. If I get this kid competitively engaged in doing this task and automating the process of seeing letters that are correctly formed, uh, the, more, the more you see those letters and the faster you see them, the more you faster you can process orthography and now start writing them too. And you can see as he did these drills with me that he's also writing at the top there. How do I make a Z? Is that the right way or is this the right way? And he's working this out in his own mind about how to, you know, identify Zs that are that are properly written so he can find if they're reversed. 
uh, and he's now he's up to 18. And we're now at session three, we're at 49. And, and he's finding 49 of those letters. Session one, I asked him to write the alphabet. This is all I got. I asked him to write a word from dictation. This is what I got. By session two, I got a few more letters. I got a, I got, actually got a word from dictation. Uh, by session three, there was a breakthrough. Because he was, and he was doing these visual discrimination uh, exercises with his parents. And I said to them, let him do as many as he can as many times as he's willing to do it every day, because the more you do it, the more you've automated that process of seeing letters in their correct form. And so, and then finding the ones that aren't. And so he did that and he had a breakthrough in session three. He was able to write the entire uh, alphabet uh, and he got the Z right. And he just like started writing Zs all over the place, right? Because not all of them are right, but he was just like so excited about this. And now by session four, we're seeing him write the whole alphabet in 32 seconds. And we're seeing him write a few more words that are from dictation. Uh, and now in, in session five, the alphabet, you know, how fast can you do that? Now, how about words from dictation? Uh, in your session six, I'm, I'm now, let me dictate a sentence to you. Let's see if you can write this sentence. Uh, and, and he's copying his, his, uh, his alphabet first, but then writing the sentence above it. And he's doing all kinds of wonderful drawing in between here, right? Uh, by session seven here, now by session eight, I'm starting to show him patterns. Now he's very good at phonological processing, his 95th percentile. So I knew that he would pick up on the patterns very quickly. And so then he even, he wanted to, let me pick the pattern. Sure, you can pick any pattern you want. And so we're teaching like, if you know A, Y, that says A. And if you add a D in front of it, that's day or B, that's bay. Now let's think of all the words, go through the alphabet and think of all the words that begin with different letters but end with a y and you can spell all those words and now he's spelling those words by going through his mind and thinking about them and now i'm teaching him these patterns and now spell all the words you can think of from the alphabet you know using these patterns and this is how i'm teaching him how to start uh, spelling words and how to think about how to spell words correctly and he's catching on to this and now session nine look at the production that i'm getting this is a kid that was avoiding writing in in, in uh, february when i started working with him I actually sorry in november he avoided it all the way through february and now March, this is where we're getting at with his, you know, with his production. And he looks at all this and, um, you know, and he's getting feedback from his teachers. Wow, you're really doing well with writing and he loves it. So every time I meet with him, I said, do you want to start with reading or writing? Writing. And so because he's getting all this praise about how good his writing is becoming. And he saw me collecting all these papers and he said to me, are you are you keeping everything I'm doing? And I said, yes, I am. He said, let me see that. And he looked at all the papers. He said, I've written all this. Yes, you have. And he said, next session. I'm going to copy all those words that I've written and I'm going to put them all between the lines neatly. Don't let me stop you, bud. Whatever you want to do, right? And so uh, his motivation now is kicking in and, and he stood there for 50 minutes. I couldn't get him to focus for even 30 seconds in the first session uh, unless I was doing that visual discrimination drill. And now I'm getting, and he stood there for 50 minutes, five zero, 50 minutes and wrote all these words from looking through the papers that I had given him. He's writing all these words and he's putting them between the line as neatly as he can, not because I'm telling him to, because that was his goal. And, and he accomplished it in that sentence, in that session. Uh, and then I'm getting letters from the teachers like, what are you doing? Because maybe we should be doing that with them at school. So that the, uh, the teacher wanted to come and observe me with what, what I was doing with them because they could see the change in him in school. Uh, and, and now uh, uh, session 11, I said to him, you know, ah, gee, I forgot that big paper. Uh, why don't we use this smaller paper and see if you can write in between the lines on the smaller paper? And you can see how it, gradually he's getting to the point where he can, he has that motor control of being able to write in between the lines on a five by seven paper. Uh, and, and, and this is what the production I got from session 11 and here's session 12. Uh, and he started out by writing in, in yellow and he said, um, I'm going to write in yellow marker. Don't let me stop you, whatever you want. And then he said to me after two pages, I can't read that. Give me a pen. Sure. Okay. And now, see, now he's writing with a, with a, with a uh, black ballpoint pen. Session 13, we took a break. He, he copied, he made this cat from, a, it's a 29 steps in how to draw this cat. And if you can follow these 29 steps and stay focused for 45 minutes drawing the cat, that's fine with me. We'll take a break from writing because sometimes you just need to take a break. So we did. Uh, but then we bounced right back in session 14 and you can see all the production here. And he announced in session 14, I'm going to fill the entire page. And he's writing these words from dictation. So I say, we're going to, we're, I'm going to take a pattern here and now I'm going to, uh, you know, dictate these words from the pattern and let's see if you can pick up the pattern and if you can write the words. And he said, I want to fill the whole page with words. Okay. But then he got four, set, four lines in and, and I decided that he would make these little designs over here. And then he had this dilemma. Ah, oh, I, I fit, I put this on the rest of the page. 
where am I going to put the rest of these words? Because I got about two more lines here. So he figured out, I'll put them out. I'll put them over here. So he finished this dictation by doing these two lines over here. And he accomplished his goal of completing, you know, filling the whole page in his mind. That was good. So I'm not going to stand in the way of production here. Uh, and this is what we're seeing here. So November 2018, this is what he was able to do. May 2019, this is the production that I'm getting from him in terms of just being able to write and spell words. Uh, and of course, then we have to start working on his writing. And so this is a story that he wrote near the end of May. And they're always mis, you know, his, his invented spellings. Uh, and then I'm, I'm correcting his, mis, uh, his invented spellings. And now he's copying so that he has it written out. Uh, so that those invented spellings are corrected. And this is what we're getting from it at the end of May. Uh, and again, this is an individual in November that was just refusing to write uh, and they couldn't really, and he was just so good in school about just avoiding, you know, can I go to the restroom? You know, and he would just, he would just, you know, not do any writing assignments in school. Uh, but, but I had to get him motivated. I get, had to get him engaged and I had to use all that motivation, you know, from him to get him to start doing what he needed to do in writing. Uh, and it was hard for him at first. Uh, and he resisted at times, but, you know, making it, turning into games and, and allowing him to kind of drive the process and being willing to kind of stop and just let him do what he wanted to do at times was really important for him. Well, okay. So we and these are the slides that I mentioned to you that kind of write out the things I did with him. And I have longer versions of this, you know, I've, I've, I've shown this case study in a number of places, but I think we should stop here and, and because we want to have some time for questions. And I know that, uh, that Jennifer has been collecting those. And so if we do have some Jennifer, Anything we should be addressing? We do. We have a lot of questions, actually, um, and, and uh, a lot of positive darn. feedback. People loved the examples in particular of um, what, how you were working with some of the kids and the exact examples. Um, a few questions around what kind of curriculums do you recommend, both for students who are in traditional school as well as homeschool? And then on top of that, especially watching this use case of how you were working with George and things like that. What types of tutors or professionals should people be looking for? Is this OT, psychology, reading tutors? There's, a, there's a, not a lot of understanding of how they can find help like this for their Yeah, very good. Well, let's start with that second part first. I think, um, you know, because the first stage, when you're five, six, or seven, we need to automate the handwriting process. So very often OTs can be very effective at helping you with that because there's there's just ways to hold the pencil. There's motor, you know, they're 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 experts in understanding motor control. It's called motor praxis and getting the executive supervisor system to run that, you know, that ability to write and develop the automaticity and handwriting that's necessary is something that an OT, you know, is really good at supervising. So early ages, I'd say get that part of it in place. And then for the other part of it, you're going to be looking for individuals that are teaching cognitive strategies, especially, you know, metacognitive strategies, because you're thinking about how to think, right? And so uh, the Association of Educational Therapists, I'm on the board, of, uh, on the advisory board for AET, and the Association of Educational Therapists are individuals, many of whom I, I've trained, who, who understand cognitive strategy instruction, as I talked about it here, and understand the need to teach strategies for writing. And so, there, so if you can find an, an educational therapist in your area, there's hotbeds of them in uh, Boston, LA, Dallas, Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, so some, some larger cities, but they're throughout the United States. And you can go to their website and find an AET, uh, an educational therapist in your area that you might want to be able to, you know, to contract with. Also, if, if you have um, teachers who say they're tutors that, that focus on metacognitive strategies, or cognitive strategy instruction. That's the important part. Do you teach cognitive strategies for writing? And if the answer is yes, then that's the person you might want to work with. Uh, and as far as what's happening in the schools, um, I, I'm not an expert in the curriculums that are being used because sometimes uh, what they say is being taught isn't necessarily what's being taught. You know, what's in a label and what's really, you know, uh, in the program, I'm not sure. So what I do know is that these cognitive strategies should be used in teaching writing. So no matter what curriculum you're using, no matter what framework you're using, if it involves teaching individuals cognitive strategies for different types of writing, you know, for different kinds of writing, uh, prose and poetry and, and research reports and, you know, technical writing, there's diff different kinds of writing. And if you're teaching strategies for different kinds of writing, uh, no matter what curriculum you're using, that's what I'm looking for. That's the key. And so I'm always talking with teachers about what strategies are you using to teach your children how to write. Uh, and so that's what we're really looking for. And, and there are many, uh, many um, 
curriculums that are pretty good in early elementary that are teaching uh, students how to write and how to edit their work and also how to edit their peers work. And and so and that's really good, but we kind of drop that by middle school. It kind of turns into this Olympic judging kind of thing, right? Teachers just grade your paper and, and say that wasn't good enough, right? Uh, you, you, and, and give you six writing assignments and you get an F on all of them, right? And basically, it's like you suck at writing. Well, you still suck. Well, you're still sucking, and it's like this is the feedback you get, right? And that's pretty discouraging. So I try to help those teachers and say you need to teach them how to write. Meaning, take that first time that you give them the assignment and give them very specific feedback about what they need to fix up and change. Now let them change it, and and go through that one writing assignment six times during that that course of that term because now you're teaching them how to write. Don't give them six separate assignments teach them how to write one well-written assignment because now you've taught them how to write. But if you simply try to grade them on six assignments and sometimes they say, well, that's not fair, but it is fair. If you don't know how to write, you need to learn how. If you do know how to write, then do six assignments for me. And, I, and I'll tell you how I, and I'll give you feedback. But if you can't write at all, we need to step all the way back and say, I need to teach you how to write. So for you, that the course assignment is learn how to write. And if you can fix this, uh, this one uh, essay up after six passes at it. If you can show me a well-written essay, then I'm going to give you the grade. You know, you're going to get a good grade in the course. And so I'm often teaching that, you know, uh, writing to mastery as opposed to writing a number of assignments to check all the boxes. No, writing to mastery. And again, in, in graduate school, I, my, my students all do that. I tell them, you all have an A in this course because at the end of the term, you're going to give me the paper that I want or the, or the report, the psychoeducational report I want, but you're going to give me a draft that I'm going to tell you what to fix up. And then I'm going to tell you what to fix up again. And we'll go through that process as many times we have to until you give me what I'm looking for. And once you give me what I'm looking for, you now know how to deliver to me what I want. But you had to learn that along the way. So it's a teaching to mastery as opposed to teaching to a criterion and, and you know, an, an expectation that you can do this on your own without that feedback. And many individuals can't do that. And I know very often most of us went through school without that feedback. And I'm talking about detailed feedback. And I would suggest by the time you get to middle school, uh, load Grammarly onto Word, onto you know Microsoft Word for your children, and get them to use Grammarly to understand how to fix up and and edit sentences that don't look right and that don't sound right. And it's it's great. I'm using it now for myself. I, I use it with all of my students' papers uh, because I want them, you know, and I show them how I'm using it and I teach them how to use it because this is, you know, you got to get feedback. And if a teacher's not going to give it to you, then you can start using some of these programs. They're getting pretty good at giving feedback. It doesn't, it doesn't. That's a perfect segue because one of the other most common questions was around assistive technology. And I always include Grammarly when I'm thinking about assistive technology, but there was some great. confusion <laughs> around you talking about how important copying was versus yeah. when do you make that switch to assistive technology? And then, um, you know, when is it important to, to actually be writing versus using that technology? And then do you have recommendations? We had one specific question on apps for middle schoolers and high schoolers and any recommendations. Yeah, so Gram Grammarly is great to have that on board. And, you know, copying those, if you can get a, a child to open up and be willing to copy sentences, it takes such a demand and a load off the brain, right? And now, and, and you can reinforce that and you can reward them for that. And it's just so much easier to do. And the more you do, you know, I, I went to Catholic school when I was in elementary school. And, you know, many of the things that they did for discipline weren't always that great. But one of them was, you know, OK, you did something wrong. Now, write 100 times. I will not do that again. Right. And and think about it. The, the individuals that often had writing problems were often some kids that, that behaved pretty poorly. Right. And so making uh, us write, you know, stay in and write as, as a punishment, right, was really strengthening our writing abilities. Copy that sentence 100 times. So you're really helping the individual automate their handwriting process, which probably is bad because uh, very often bad behavior and, and writing problems go, to, go hand in hand, right? Usually uh, very often the writing problem came first <laughs> and the behavior problem is like to, to disguise the fact you don't know how to write. You know, but making individuals learn how to copy sentences was something that actually there was some wisdom to it. And, and I've used that with so many students that resist the writing process. And it opens up the possibilities here because one of my favorite authors, Ken Wilbers, you know, they said to him, how did you get so good at writing on complicated topics and writing so well about them? And he said, well, there are two philosophers whose works I liked a lot. And for each of them, I took one of their books and I copied it word for word so that by the time I got the last chapter, I could write it because I was thinking the way they thought. 
And if you want to absorb a writer's voice, copy that writer's you know work. And now, now you're 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 as you're copying it, you're starting to think like that writer. So there's nothing wrong with copying. And as I said, musicians do it all the time. You know, so many musicians never play their own compositions. They can't even write them, right? Uh, they play other people's compositions. Some people cannot write for themselves. They are copying other written sources or they're modeling their own writing on sources very closely, right? And of course, if you write too closely and you don't acknowledge it, that's plagiarism. So you have to get them to start weaning off of that copying process. But I have to take my, my graduate students, they'll give me long quotations and they'll, they'll cite the source and I'll say, that's great, but your paper is filled with quotations. I want you to learn how to write sentences as well as the authors that you think write well, good sentences. So take that first quote and I want you to copy it. Now copy it again. Now copy it again. And I get them to copy it 10 times. Now that you've copied it 10 times, put that away and I want you to write those thoughts in your own words. And because you've copied it 10 times, those words are still in your mind and you're thinking about how that, that author wrote them. And now you can write your own words from that because sometimes holding it in working memory is the hardest part. So training individuals how to think like a, well, you know, a, a good writer is often getting them to practice that act of writing so much that they know it so well that they can now start constructing their own thoughts in, in the form of that good writing. And you can take very simple writing in, in you know, young children's books and copy it. You know, because you're, you're learning how to just write basic, simple sentences that are real well written uh, and then start transitioning. Now, let's talk about your own thoughts. Uh, and Virginia Bernie always says she warms up by teaching kids. In, in, at age five, write, the, write all the letters of the alphabet. Now that you've written all the letters of the alphabet, let's think about something that you did or that you're going to write about. Let's talk about that. Okay, now write one sentence about something you did uh, because they warmed up their hand by copying the alphabet. And for me, then I would say, and later then have them copy sentences. And now that you've copied a few sentences, now let's talk about your own ideas and now let's start writing. So warming up the hand first, getting them into the act of writing before you dump the whole load on them of like, think your own thoughts and write them, right? How about we just get your some parts of the system warmed up so that those workers are coordinated and they're doing their part. And now you can get the supervisor system, just bring in some other parts and layer them on top of those parts that are working pretty well now. And so if you if you want to scaffold that by by copying and then starting to write your own sentences, you know, that's kind of how you bridge from uh, from that copying to uh, to writing your own sentences, but do them together, you know, and then gradually you can just go, let's not even do the copying thing. Let's just talk about it for a little while. Now write your own sentences and now now talk to yourself about it without me and write your own sentences. So it's a gradual process. And, and you know, it can take years to learn that. And so it's that that patience also that has to come with this. Right. It's not going to come overnight. It's hard to do. I get that. I know that. But the more you do it, the better out you're going to get. You have to train your brain to do it. And your brain doesn't know how to do it right now. So the more little things we can do and the more you look at words and the more you write letters and the more you write words, the better your brain gets at doing that. And you have to be able to automate that process of knowing how to spell a word so that it just flows out of your hand without thinking about how to spell it. Uh, but you'll still get stuck on some words and they'll be hard for you to, and they just have to do, you know, I don't know that word, underline it, and we'll come back to that word later. So it's a gradual process, but it's it's hard. It's hard and the motivation, you know, some, sometimes the external motivation has to come like, okay, I'll reward you, you know, and and, it, and if a little reward gets them to write, then don't don't stop the rewards, right? Use them as long as they work. When they stop working, you know, what's plan B? Because some kids will go, no, that's it. I'm not going to write anymore. I don't care what you give me. It's just, it's too hard. Now you have to demystify it, break it down into smaller parts so that they can do the smaller parts and then put them uh, together into the larger part. That's great. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. We greatly appreciate you coming today and speaking to the community. Lots of positive feedback. Um, we were so happy to have you. For those who are still on, I'm going to put a quick poll on how was the webinar um, up for everybody so we can get some official feedback. But we want to thank Dr. McCloskey that there were a number of people who asked, yes, the recording of the full webinar will be available on the Dyscraphia Life website. Um, we, the, we have a page for all of our webinars. I encourage you to go back and watch. Many of them are excellent, um, but this one will be up in about a week. And we want to thank you for your time today and all this great information and particularly um, lots of positive feedback on the stories and how you worked with kids. And I think thinking about executive function versus just the process of handwriting was very helpful for a number of people. 
So you're most welcome. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm, I'm always, you know, uh, always willing to talk with parent groups and, and, uh, and professionals, uh, to, you know, to, to learn more about this topic and, and we all have to get better at writing all of us. And the more, the more we all know about how to do it, the better off we're all going to be. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much and have, have a nice great guys. night, everyone.